Well, happy St. Patrick's Day. I was preparing for this message today, thinking about the many times over the course of my life as a public school student, growing up in a small town, then going to a secular college, that people came up to me and tried to convert me. It's funny that that never happens now when I'm wearing the collar. But over the years, it happened many times from the time I was a, a kid. And I had one roommate in college who was a good friend, and he was a very sincere Baptist involved in the Campus Crusade for Christ on campus. And he sincerely wanted to convert me away from the Catholic faith and gave me pamphlets about it, shared it with me. Well, I always absolutely hate this when people come to me like this. Don't bother with me, please. But with him, with my friend, I responded by giving him Catholic pamphlets. And what it forced me to do is to, to really, really articulate my faith more deeply. You know, I, I really respond negatively if someone tries to come up to me and do that, knocking on the door. But, but in those experiences, I've learned to deepen my faith and to share my faith. And so we, this week in our wrapping up and concluding this series, this message for Lent that's been all about going deeper in our faith. Now, I hope that you've experienced, at least in some regard, a renewal, a revival, or maybe a rebuilding of your faith, whether you're skeptical or not. You know, these things that we've been talking about are what matter because these are what Jesus talks about in the gospel. And so these steps, the sacrament steps, are vital. They're vital for all of us who claim to be a follower of Christ, a Christian, a lifelong disciple of Him. If you ignore one of these, or if you resist one of these, or if there's a spiritual gap in some way in your life, you know, you'll be shorthanded in your spiritual growth. But over time, we can take these on as spiritual habits, as lifestyle choices. And we, our relationship with Christ uh, uh, can grow. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's about a path of discipleship. And so we've looked at the first four thus far. We've looked at serving. We've looked at tithing and giving. We've looked at engaging in Christian community. And we looked last week at practicing prayer and the sacraments. If you'd like to catch up, if you missed any of these past homilies or messages, just you can go to our website always, churchofstjohn.com, and there click on the link, Messages, to catch up. So it's all appropriate today on this St. Patrick's Day weekend. St. Patrick, who was a great missionary, the early church to the island of Ireland, that we talk about that last one, sharing our faith. But let's be honest, for me, and I, I suspect for many of you, this is the most intimidating and daunting of all. Most of us who grew up Catholic never learned anything about this. We don't know anything about sharing our faith. And for the skeptical person, you may really, really resist this. It, you might think, why do that? It's rude. It's inappropriate. Live and let live. And even the most cynical person might say, okay, the Catholic Church is losing members, so you have to talk about this uh, out of desperation. And I would say, no, absolutely not. This is something much more personal. It's not about banging someone over the head with the Bible. It's something much more than that, sharing our faith. I'm not making this up. You may, you probably know the words of Jesus. After he rose from the dead, right before he ascended to heaven on the mountain, he said his last and greatest commandment, go and make disciples of all nations. We call that the great commission. And traditionally, the Catholic Church has understood this in a couple different ways. One, literally go and make disciples by having babies, by having large families. Like traditionally, a lot of Catholics had large families. And second, go and make disciples by supporting the foreign missions that are in faraway places and financially helping priests and religious sisters and the so-called professional missionaries to go to these foreign lands like Africa and India. 
You know, you can remember in Catholic school supporting the pagan babies, right? When you were little, some of you very young. So those are the two traditional ways that Catholics went and made disciples. But let's face it, the world has drastically changed. It, even since I have grown up, one, for various reasons, for better or for ill, people don't have large families. And two, our mission field, our mission field is not in some far away land anymore, but it's all around us. And it's just drastically changing. If you are a believer in Christ and at work or at school, even in some people's homes, it may be the exception. You're the only believer in your workplace, in your office, or in school. That's just the reality we face today. The mission field is here. It's all around us. And so there's got to be a different new understanding. And again, honestly, I push back against this because of my personality. And I think, I'm a priest. Don't I share my faith enough up here on the altar? Let the extroverted people do that, who are people, you know, who just love to be around people. So how can we make this less daunting, less intimidating, and more accessible to us? I think it really comes down to one phrase and even one simple word. And so to look at that, I will I'll look at the gospel story today from John's gospel. But at this point... We are in the last few weeks of Jesus' life. And according to John's Gospel, interestingly, Jesus performs uh, his last and great miracle which sets off everything in motion. He goes to Bethany and he resurrects his good friend Lazarus. Maybe you're familiar with that scene in John chapter 11. He waits four days. He goes to the tomb of Lazarus. He calls him out. Lazarus, come out! Lazarus comes out of the tomb. What an amazing miracle. So the crowds witnessed this, and you can imagine that attracted a lot of attention. People from all over wanted to see Lazarus, and they wanted to see Jesus. But Jesus was immensely popular, and he entered then Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which we celebrate Next week, the crowds waved palm branches and they sang, Hosanna to the Son of David. Jesus then got the, the ire and the jealousy of the Pharisee and the religious leaders. And at one point, they say this, We're getting nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. At least it seemed like to them, to the religious leader, the whole world is following Jesus. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if we lived in that world today where the whole world was following Jesus? But we don't. Times have changed. But yet, I think the name of Jesus is still attractive. The name of Jesus, whenever we say it, it still attracts some wonder. You see, Jesus, there's no doubt, was immensely popular. People who were nothing liked him, liked him. He crossed barriers. He invited him to conversion, to follow him always. And one of the most unfortunate things that's happened in many, many churches is that we turn inward. We become a kind of social club or holy huddle. We fail to become that light to the nations that attracts and welcomes outsiders, the unchurched, those who are far from God, to come to Jesus. Jesus was immensely popular. And so maybe the Pharisees here are using hyperbole. But still, notice it's no accident what the very next verse says in John's Gospel. Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who is from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And so Greeks, pagans, Gentiles, they are now coming to see Jesus. These were probably people who were already attracted to Judaism. They were maybe even uh, converts to Judaism. That's why they were coming on pilgrimage to Jerusalem to the Passover feast. And they're from the same neighborhood as the Apostle Philip from Bethsaida. And so they asked him, we would like to see Jesus. Can you bring him to us? Now just put yourself in Philip the Apostle's shoes. Someone comes to you and says, we would like to see Jesus. 
What would you say? Or in more general terms, if someone said to you, why are you Catholic? Why are you Christian? Tell me about your faith and what that means to you. What would you say? To me, the key is one simple word, hope. You know, one of my favorite scripture verses is from the first letter of Peter. Peter says this, always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you to give a reason for your hope. Do it with gentleness and reverence. And this to me is kind of preparing in your own words your response. What is the reason for your hope? How do you articulate that in your own words? Like a salesperson who has to have an elevator speech. You're on an elevator, you have to make a one sentence sell. What are your own words about the reason for your hope? And this could be different things to different people. For those of you who are reading the Rebuilt Faith book, you're going to read about this and get some thoughts about how you can respond. What is the reason for your hope? It may be because you have experienced the joy and compassion of Christ. It's that simple. You want to share that joy. That's the reason for your hope. Maybe you're like me, you're a little more intellectual. And so it's the logic of faith. It's the sharing of the scripture, the teachings of the church. It just makes logical sense. And you want to defend the faith intellectually. Or maybe the, you're the opposite. Maybe you're more a feeler than a thinker. You're a creative person. And it's the, it's the aesthetic of faith. It's the beauty and art and all those things that tug at our heart, give us passion that attracts you to faith. That's the reason for your hope. Or maybe you've had a moral conversion. In your previous life, you lived outside of, of any kind of religion or guidance, and you have found a better way to live by coming back to faith and church. And you want to share that. We all have, I hope, a reason for our hope. So anyway, back to John's gospel, we don't know what Philip was thinking when those Gentiles were asking about Jesus, but he goes to Andrew. That's interesting. The, another apostle. And Andrew simply accompanies him to Jesus. Now maybe in sharing your faith, you're like Andrew. You just bring people, you accompany them. And so the two of them come with the news of these new converts to Jesus, and he responds. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Oh, Jesus, upon hearing the news that now even the Gentiles are beginning to come to faith in Him, knows that this is His time. This is finally His hour that has arrived that he must go the walk, the way of the cross. And he says, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, won't produce fruit, he knows that his mission is one of the cross in order to produce the fruit of the abundance of redemption. You know, it's interesting that he doesn't sugarcoat the cross. He doesn't hide it. He doesn't dismiss it or lessen its significance. Announcing and sharing the good news involves the cross. And so very directly, he says to Philip and Andrew, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. That's the paradox, the paradox of life and our faith. The faith in the kingdom, the paradox of being a follower of Christ is through death that comes life. Whoever loves the things of the world, our ambitions, our attachments, our ideas will lose them. But then he says, whoever hates his life. He doesn't mean that you go around saying, I hate my life. That's a Jewish idiom, a Jewish expression that means love less. It's saying, you value the kingdom over anything else in this world. And that, my friends, is hope. That's the source of hope. And this is, sharing our faith has everything to do with this because guess what? In our culture today, in our secular culture, 
you're not going to win any brownie points for sharing your faith. You're not going to get promoted in your job for sharing your faith. Probably the opposite. You know, you'll, it, it'll be at the best uh, just people ignore you, if not hostility. We're not winning anything in this world, and there is good news because it's a sacrifice. And sacrifice to, to reach others with the good news of Christ, we uh, become more like Him. Our character is transformed. That's hope. And now, I know there are some of you who just want to say to me, Father, you tell me to share my faith. Have a reason for hope. Have a positive testimony to give about faith. You might say, I just don't have one. I'm struggling. I'm struggling because of a cancer diagnosis. I'm struggling because of a loss of a loved one, or I'm divorced and so alone. I'm struggling because I lost my job, and I can't provide for my family. Well, my friends, the good news is that the answer is the cross. You see, you may not have hope in the present, but the cross is always pouring out grace the grace that there is hope for you. There is hope in store of enduring and persevering in this moment that you may bear that cross and have the promise of life. So just think about this. In all the steps of discipleship, of following Jesus, I've talked about, there's always a sacrifice and an exchange. So think about it. In exchange for service, we find we find a purpose in our life. In exchange for giving, financially, we find and discover that God is the giver and we can trust Him. In exchange for engaging in community, we find encouragement that we all need. In exchange for committing to prayer and practicing prayer, we find intimacy with the love of God. And the greatest exchange in the sacrifice of sharing our faith is hope. We find that the hope in store for us is real. When we partner with Christ and His mission, as He said, He came to save and seek the lost. That's why He came to this world. We partner with one another as that church to be a light to the nations. And together then, be, by becoming an evangelizing, welcoming church, bringing people who are lost on a discipleship path toward Him, we find vitality, we find energy, we find what we truly are meant to be, resurrection people, where the good news is always good. And so may we take up that calling to share our faith. And so as we wrap up this series for Lent, I have a couple invitations for you. Well, first of all, in two weeks, the conclusion of Holy Week is our Super Bowl here at the church, it, especially here in the Poconos. St. John's Easter Sunday is the day in which we see more people than any other day of the year here, even Christmas. Maybe 1,500, almost 2,000 people come into our building. And so here's a one-time service opportunity. This worked at Christmas so wonderfully. Maybe, uh, maybe you're called to this. All you have to do is show up early and welcome others to the door. You could, by your welcoming someone to the door, share the good news of the risen Christ. In fact, I heard a testimony about someone this happened last year. They walked in the door, and now they're active in our parish, and they're in a small group. And so I just invite you out to Mass, if you'd like, for the 8.30 or the 11 o'clock at Easter Sunday to serve in hospitality ministry. It could be a very fun thing. And then for all of us, invest and invite. That's the simple strategy for those, your loved ones, family members, co-workers, friends, who don't have a relationship with Christ and His church, just invite them to Easter. And to make it easy, we pass out the postcards which has our Holy Week and Easter schedule. If that's simple, you could change someone's life to bring them closer to the risen Christ. Well, my friends, sharing our faith and going deep in our faith, deeper in our faith are really two sides of the same coin. And sharing our faith, our own faith, will always grow. And bottom line, we share our faith because we want people to know the way, the truth, and the life. Because in the end, 
It's all about Jesus Christ. Amen.